Well, we're in the middle of a series called Faith Works, and uh, how many know that the life of faith in Christ, it works? Uh, it does everything that the Father promises it's going to do. How many of you, uh, just by a little witness, would say amen? That's true for you. Amen. Now, um, during this series, we've kind of keyed in on one particular word, and um, one of the things we discuss in the foundation of this is that uh, in, the, in the Greek language, there's actually seven words for the word faith, and one of those seven words is actually used 90% of the time in the New Testament, and that word specifically means divine persuasion. It means that when you read the word faith, that it's, it's just describing the implications of God divinely uh, inspiring and divinely persuading the heart of man towards something, usually himself and his redemption for you and I. And so today we're going to talk uh, in week number three about faith for relationships. Somebody say faith, faith. For, for relationships. I'm just trying to wake you all up a little bit this morning and myself. How many of y'all got your coffee this morning? How many still need your coffee or you need a little bit more? I, me too, me too, me too. Well, um, we're going to take a look at three type of relationships that matter to God today. Uh, these aren't all the relationships that matter to him, but we're just going to kind of zone in on three of them. Uh, the first relationship that matters to God in your notes is you. That's right. You matter to God. That's a very important relationship to the heart of God. Did you know that the Father loves you and I so much that he desires to fulfill every single one of your needs? So much, in fact, that, that he created you, he fashioned you, and he knows every way that you tick. He knows every single one of your desires, and he knows how to take care of those things like nobody else. How many of you guys um, remember uh, in 1996, I know I'm kind of dating myself, but there was a movie that came out and it had a very, very popular uh, line in the movie. It was a romantic comedy and I know I'm dating myself, but uh, the famous line comes from a movie. Now Landon's over here going, what's the movie? I bet you I know the line and I bet you he does. Uh, the movie's Jerry Maguire. And um, so I'm gonna count to three and I don't know how many of y'all know the line in this movie, but I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to see if you know the line. Are you ready? One, two, three. Show me the money is definitely one of them. Man, this movie has, uh, my illustration is just so broken right now. It had great, now, show me the money was definitely one of them, and what is the other romantic line in the movie? One, two, three. You complete me. Now, I'm not sure. You know, some of you had it right. Some of you had it a little messed up. But I'm just going to give it to you. The line in the movie is, you complete me. Jerry Maguire, he's looking at the, the love of his life. And, and it's one of those moments. You hear the music in the background. And it wasn't raining, but you just you can feel it, right? Music in the background. They're raining. And he, it's raining on them. And they're wet. And he's just like, I love you so much. And he says these words, you complete me. Now, I understand the sentiment of, of that statement. But um, it's not very good relationship advice. Um, I believe that that phrase, you complete me, is, is a lie that the enemy tries to get you and I to believe when it comes to our relationships with others. Um, I think that God loves to complete us himself. Um, the enemy wants to distract us and make us pursue relationships thinking that these other relationships will complete the deepest needs of our heart. And that's not how it works. I love what uh, Colossians 2.10 uh, declares. It says this, Paul says this, he says, um, uh, and you have being made in Christ, Christ is the head, he's over every ruler and over every authority. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, you were created in Christ. You were created to be satisfied in Christ, uh, to be fulfilled in Christ, not in any other place. Now, I know that you and I, we've, we've got some good relationships and, and people invest some really good things in us, but I, I want us to really understand something. When people bless us and people love us, we have to attribute what we're receiving from them as a gift from God. Because people in themselves, they don't have the ability to complete you and I. Here's the challenge. The challenge is this, is that when we enter relationships with an unhealthy expectation for others to complete us, and they fail. How many have ever had anybody fail at helping you out? When they fail, we begin to blame them. We blame them for our lack, our lack of love, our lack of protection, our lack of provision. 
We blame them for our wounds, our pains, our flaws, and we hold grudges. And in the most extreme way, when we enter these relationships, whether it's a romantic relationship with a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend, or maybe it's a friendship or a coworker to employer relationship, when we enter unhealthy in this way and expect others to fulfill us, we enter that relationship saying, hey, would you please fix what's broken? We enter that relationship and say, hey, would you please fill me up? Would you please complete me? Would you please heal me? When we ask others to do this kind of thing for us, we're asking them to be responsible for something only God knows how to do. Because you're created in his image. He knows how to perfectly fulfill everything that you need. So how are we going to start living a life that, that is saying to the world, I know that I matter to God? Here's what we can do in your notes. We can change our expectations. Rather than expecting others to fulfill us and to complete us, we can start expecting our good father to do exactly what he promises. And his desire is to divinely persuade you constantly that he's the fulfiller of all of your needs. It'd be a really good idea for you and I to memorize scriptures like Philippians 4.19. Here's what it says. But my God will supply all of our needs according to his riches, he's really rich, in glory by Christ Jesus. God wants to fulfill all of our needs. And that's the point that Paul was trying to get across to this group of people. It's this, this providing of our needs is not about like um, giving us all of our wants. It's not about getting us um, the latest tech gadget, although those are fun. Um, it's not about that at all. But it's about fulfilling your deepest human and spiritual needs. God fulfills those things perfectly. We're talking about understanding and realizing that we matter to God. We've got to change our expectations. And the next thing we need to do is we need to challenge our minds. What do I mean by challenging your minds? It means that we need to remind ourselves that every time we enter a relational space, that we remind ourselves of this. I am full and complete and I lack nothing here. I'm not depending on you to fix me. I'm not depending on you to heal me. I'm not depending on you to do anything for me that God the Father hasn't already done for me. So here's what this means. When you enter these spaces, you're saying things like, I enter my marriage full. No matter how much my spouse does or doesn't do, I am still full and complete, not lacking anything. When we enter um, our relationships with our adult parents as adult children, no matter what they did or didn't do for us as kids, we can enter that relationship full and complete and not lacking anything. When we enter into the workplace, no matter how much we're appreciated or no matter how much uh, we think that our job duties and our salaries match, we can enter that space and we can say, I am full and complete and I don't lack anything. We can enter into any friendship, no matter if, if you are the main contributor in the friendship or not, you can enter to that friendship and say, I am full and complete and I don't lack a thing. Man. That would change things a lot for most of the relationships we're in if we begin to live that way. We've got to challenge our minds to realize that we matter so much to the Father that he fully fulfills us. And when we realize how full we are, we don't have to be concerned with things like, oh, I'm, I'm out giving so much in this relationship and they're not giving back to me. No, who cares? Because you're already full in Christ. And you don't have to be worried about, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm serving this person more than they're serving me. I'm loving them more. I'm forgiving them more. No, because your fullness comes from Christ, not from what that other person in that relationship is doing for you. That allows you, when the people around you are really struggling and they're on empty, for you just to pour out and it doesn't even matter because your, your, uh, your fullness is not dependent upon that relationship. I love what... Uh, uh, Psalms 34 and 10 says, it says, the young lions suffer want and hunger. I kind of see that as, as the immature, the new believer, before they realize they're full in Christ, the young lions suffer and wants and they're hungry. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. 
you know, that's a newsflash to some of us. And, and I gotta tell you, I gotta fully admit that there's times in my day where I think that I'm lacking and I'm expecting others to fulfill me. But how, how many of you know that multiple times a day we ought to just declare to our soul that I am full and complete in Christ, not lacking a thing. Why don't you just try that right now? Somebody say, I'm full and I'm complete, not lacking anything. We're talking about faith for relationships. The first relationship we notice it really matters to God is, is your relationship with him. The next one is friends, yeah. Friends matter to God. This is a, a really important relationship for you from God. Friendships are the special people that God puts in our lives, the brothers and sisters in Christ that we do life with. And friends are to be the voice of faith to each other that is divinely persuading one another of how amazing God is and how amazing he has fulfilled us and how amazing he has completed us. That's what the voice of friends do. Chris and I have some amazing friends in our life and, and um, God has used so many times these relationships uh, to strengthen one, our faith in one another and vice versa in Christ. Scripture is also full of a ton of, of examples of relationships just like this. As we think about Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila, or maybe Jesus, Mary, and Martha, I want to take a look for a moment at one of the ways that Scripture says we can be the voice of faith to our friends. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, um, up on the screen, here's what it says. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. Another translation says one can lift the other up. Friendships are designed to lift one another up. It's important to the heart of God that you've got good friends that know how to lift you up. Because it's nearly impossible to live this life of Christ alone without another co-labor with you. It makes things light and easy. And the question I have for you is, who has God put in your life that you would consider a friend? One of those that he wants faith to be exchanged between the two of you. And the next question is, is how exactly are you lifting them up when it comes time to pull them up? I wanna suggest two ways that the Bible describes we can lift one another up. The first way in your notes is to lift up Adam. And the second way in your notes is to lift up Christ. Now, Sean, what in the world do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. Adam in the Bible represents the natural man, a man who is a, a naturally born, he's a slave to sin. This man, Adam, is so prideful that he thinks that he could just work harder and be more disciplined and do it. How many of you know that that never, that never works when it comes to your matchup against sin? You lift up this man, Adam, the old man, the dead man, with giving him more works, giving him more discipline, and pointing out his flaws. And that's what it means to lift up Adam. Now, when we're talking about lifting up our brother, when I say, are you lifting him up as lifting up Christ, here's what I mean by that. Christ represents a spiritually born man, not a naturally born man. Christ is a slave of righteousness, and you lift this man up by speaking words of faith to this man and calling out his spiritual nature in him. How do we know if we're lifting up our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ? How do we know if we're lifting him up in Adam or lifting him up in Christ? Let me help you out with this one. If you're lifting up your friends in Adam, Here's how you can know you're doing that. Because you're putting a spotlight on your sin. You're, you're focusing on what is wrong with them. Rather than if you're lifting up Christ in somebody, you put a spotlight on Christ in them and you focus on what's right in them. If you wanna put a, a spotlight on Adam and lift up Adam, then just keep trying to discipline that old dead nature that's a slave to sin. And when you start doing that, it's so often that this individual can become to identify themselves as their sin. If you wanna lift up Christ in somebody, you remind one another of their new nature and that they're a slave to righteousness and they don't have to listen to sin. And when you do that, you're not defining somebody by their sin, but you're defining them by Christ. If you're gonna lift up Adam, then you're gonna focus on the fallen man, the man who fell, and the man who was crushed by sin. 
If you're going to focus on Christ, then we're going to the focus on the man who has raised a new life and the man who conquered over sin. Do you see it? Do you see the difference between lifting up Christ in somebody and lifting up that old dead man of sin? What does it sound like when you and I, with our words, are lifting up a brother in Adam or a brother in Christ? When we're interacting with our friends and we're exchanging faith, if we're lifting up Adam, we say things like, you better love God because your life doesn't look like you do. If you're lifting up Christ, you say things like, God loves you as you are. In fact, he loves you so much, he's not gonna leave you the same. He's gonna keep putting people like me in your life to lift you up. When you're lifting up Adam, you say things like, God can forgive you if... But if you're lifting up Christ in somebody, you can declare to them, God has already forgiven you. I love uh, what John says in 1 John 2 and 12. John is saying this, he's saying to a group of believers, he's saying, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on the account of his name, not on the account of your name. You're not forgiven because you did something great. No, you're forgiven because he did something great for you. When you lift up Adam, you say things like, man, you really need to get it right because I can't see any holiness in you. You better get holy. When you lift up Christ, you say things like, hey, God declares you as holy. The response is coming out of your world. Don't look holy and that's not who you are. I love what Colossians 1, towards the end of this verse says. Colossians 1, says this, as a result, in other words, the result of Christ in you and salvation, Paul says, as a result, church, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless and you stand before him without a single fault. Wow. How often do you think about that towards yourself? How often do you realize that I stand before the Father holy and blameless and without fault? because I'm being judged by my spiritual nature, not my natural nature. When you lift up Adam, you say things like, hey, God can help you if you. When you lift up Christ in somebody, you can declare to somebody, God has helped you. Before you were born, he sent his son to die on a cross. When you were absolutely helpless and you could do nothing to help yourself, he helped you. That's really good news. You know, the majority of Paul's letters were given to the church to help them to think right. How many of you know that if we get our thinking right, our life is gonna go a whole different direction? Why? Because right thinking leads to right living. I'm gonna say that again. Right thinking leads to right living. If your thoughts are wrapped up around wrong ideas about God and wrapped around wrong ideas about yourself, then I'm here to tell you that you're never gonna get to enjoy the life of faith that God has provided for you. He is doing his part to divinely persuade you and I. The question is, is do we believe it? Are we gonna come into agreement with him on what he's saying about you and I? Now, this next statement I wanna make is quite strong. When we lift up Adam and others, we act as a slave master, like a law master. And when we're trying to help somebody in the name of God, but yet we add a heavy weight and a heavy load on them with more laws, rules, and regulations, just like the Pharisees did, we're saying to them that we know better than Jesus. Some of us may not be convinced that, that uh, only we should lift up Christ in somebody. Let me give you another scripture. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. It's so powerful. There's so many implications in this scripture. Here's what it says. He has enabled us, is talking about believers, to be ministers of the new covenant. This covenant, not of, not of written laws, but of spiritual laws. The old covenant written ends in death, but the new covenant, the spirit, gives life. I'm telling you today that when we put, when we're lifting up Adam, when we put more weight on others, we're giving written laws to one another. And written laws only end in one place. They end in death. 
That is why it's so important for you and I as believers to be ministers of a new covenant that gives the spirit of God and that gives life to one another. It's so important for us to not put people under law, but to put people under grace. Here's the question I have for you. What covenant are you ministering to your friends when they need you to lift them up? I wanna challenge you to lift up your friends in Christ and point them to Jesus. The burden lifter, the life giver, the shame eliminator, the dead raiser, the one who opens the eyes of the spiritually blind and deaf and lame, the one who puts homes back together, the one that heals, the one that reconciles families, the one that frees the addict. We do that by lifting up Christ in one another. We're talking about relationships that matter to God. We notice that you matter to God and that friends matter to God. And lastly today, strangers matter to God. Yeah, strangers matter to God. What's a stranger? Who is a stranger? A stranger is simply this, a person that you're not familiar with. It could be that you're not familiar with their way of life or their culture or their nationality, their religion, their economic status, their gender, their sexuality. Anybody know any strangers, people that you just, you don't connect in many different ways? Jesus was constantly interacting with strangers, people who were very different from him. After all, he was the son of God in a human body. There was nobody like him. Everybody, in fact, that he encountered was a stranger to him. Let's, let's talk about the Samaritan woman. He interacted with this Samaritan woman, was a stranger from him. In that time, in that culture, Jewish men were not supposed to be interacting with women. And not only that, she was a Samaritan. And the racism that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews, it was great. They should have never been interacting with one another, but Jesus interacted with strangers. Who might the Samaritan woman represent for you? Who do you have a hard time loving? Who do you have a hard time spending time with? Who might you be resisting in your life that God might be asking you to embrace like he did the Samaritan woman? Another stranger that Jesus interacted with was the Roman centurion found in Matthew chapter eight. Jesus extended his healing hands to this Roman centurion. This Roman centurion represented one of Jesus' enemies. He was totally against what Jesus was trying to accomplish. Not only was he Jesus' enemy, he was also his political enemy. I hate to disappoint us today, but Jesus' political enemies are anybody who lifts up a political party above the kingdom. Jesus doesn't have a political party. His political party is kingdom of God. The Romans stood politically against everything Jesus stood for, and how did Jesus respond? Did he gather his disciples up to go have a protest against the Romans? No. What did he do? He stayed on mission. He went and found the lonely and the lost and the hurting and the broken, and he stayed on mission to heal and minister love to them and continue to declare the message of the kingdom so that the, the sick could be healed, the blind could see, the lame could begin to walk. And as he did that, guess what he didn't do? He didn't discriminate. Who might the Roman centurion represent for you? Who is your opposing political party? Who is your enemy? Now, I know this is a really big ask because when we just look around in our world today, it's quite hostile. And here's why it's hostile, because people are strangers to one another. They don't get each other. How did Jesus love strangers so well when it seems like we don't know how to do it very well at all? I believe that he did it in your notes through kindness. He did it through kindness. Now, outside of his harsh words for the religious elite and the Pharisees and those who are standing in the way of the message of the gospel, he was very kind to strangers. He had a kindness like, kindness like nobody else. Romans 2, Paul is telling a group of religious leaders. He is saying, hey guys, why are you judging people so hard? Where's your kindness? I mean, you want kindness from God, but when it comes to extending it to others, you have such a hard time giving it. Here's what it says, Romans 2, 4. He's saying, hey, you sh you're showing contempt for the riches of his kindness. And his forbearance, another word for forbearance could be the word tolerance and patience. He's saying, you're so angry 
that God is wanting to show his kindness, his tolerance, and his patience to others, yet you know that it's his kindness that leads people to repentance. And you want it yourself, but you don't want to extend it to others. And I, I think he's kind of asking this group of people, what's it going to be, guys? You can't have your cake and eat it too. You're going to have to choose one. You're going to have to either choose kindness for everyone or kindness for no one. And I guarantee you, I know what they chose. They had to choose kindness for everyone. Paul was trying to help uh, his audience understand that the demands of their law and the threat of their punishment would not lead to change. It would not lead to transformation. It would not lead to repentance. But what Jesus did know is that the kindness of the Lord would lead people to change. What's holding back God's kindness from this world? I want to propose to you uh, that it may be one thing. A couple, a couple months back, um, I was praying and, and reading and thinking and talking to the Lord, and, and the Lord said, Sean, you don't know how to receive my kindness. You think my kindness has limits. And he said, Sean, you can only give the same kind of kindness that you yourself are receiving from me. And Sean, you think that your kindness comes into your inner being and it comes into this space of your life and you receive it there well. And you receive it really well in, in this space of your life. But in this space of your life, you stop my kindness. You hinder it. And you hold me out of that space in your life. And because you can't let me enter that space with kindness, you enter that space with condemnation, with judgment, with shame, with nothing. And that is not how I'm trying to enter you. I'm trying to enter every space of your life with kindness. And Sean, when you put limits on my kindness towards yourself, you're gonna put those same limits on others because when you see those behaviors and those actions and those inner thoughts out of others, your kindness is only gonna go so far from them, far with them. And it's gonna only extend until you see that thing that you see in yourself and then it's gonna stop. But if you let me enter you fully, and let my kindness go in every space of your life, then and only then can you allow my kindness that leads to a repentance enter in the space of those around you. I think the only thing that puts a limit on God's kindness is that we don't know how to receive it ourselves. therefore we don't know how to give it. How are you loving the strangers in your world? Are you loving them well? It starts with you. It starts with you being kind to yourself and you allowing the Holy Spirit to enter you with his kindness and not stopping him. Let him go all the way through. I think that when we allow that kind of kindness to enter our life, we're gonna be able to be a whole lot more kind to the people around us. And here's, here's what it takes is you and I getting radically aware of where he extends kindness in you and you know you don't deserve it. Radically aware. As we wrap up our message today, Jesus is giving us faith for relationships. God is at work in all types of relationships in our life and you matter to him. And, and in the relationship between you and the Father, God is divinely persuading you that you're full in Christ. And friendships also matter to him. And in the relationship between you and your friends, God is divinely persuading you of who you are in Christ. And lastly, strangers matter so much to God. And in your relationship with strangers, he is divinely persuading the world that his love has no boundaries, that it will go anywhere and everywhere. Our takeaway for today is this. God is at work in relationships to divinely persuade the world of himself. We are messengers of his kindness that leads repentance to the world. Can you say amen for his good word today? It's a challenging word. It's a tough word. You know why? Because we can't do it on our own. We need divine persuasion to make it happen. We need faith. We need faith to love well. We need faith to believe well that we are full and complete not lacking anything.